Today is June 29th, 2021, and my guest is economist Don Boudreau of George Mason University. Don blogs at Cafe Hayek. This is his 15th appearance on Econ Talk. He was last here in January of 2021 talking about the work of James Buchanan. Don, welcome back to Econ Talk. Always good to be here, Russ. Our topic for today is the pandemic, and your take is. I think quite a bit different from many of the guests we've had before on the program to discuss the pandemic and corona. I hope we'll we'll be able to explore some new issues of policy compared to previous conversations that I've had on the topic. So I want to start with our um, taking a long view of how the world, the United States, other countries have reacted in terms of policy to the pandemic. You argue that we've overreacted and overreacted badly. Make the case. Uh, The, what we learned early on about SARS-CoV-2 is that it is for people basically 70 and older, uh, more dangerous than the flu. It's, it's not, it's not definitely going to kill you, but it's, it's got a higher uh, infection fatality rate than does ordinary influenza. For people younger than that, it really doesn't. Um, The, I think the images that came out of Wuhan back in early 2020, where you saw people uh, lying on the streets with shopping bags as if they just been walking along and they just dropped dead. That frightened a lot of people. My guess is, I don't know for sure, my guess is that those photographs were were staged because we know now that That's not how SARS-CoV-2 kills. It can kill you quickly, but it's not as if you're walking along healthy and the next minute you're dead. There were some real problems in Italy. Uh, So we saw these horrible images coming out of Northern Italy of people in hospitals. And and these images, in, in part because of our enormously advanced technology, media technology to show images from around the world, um, and, and I think the, 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 the psychological biases that we humans have always had, you know, you look at the present and, and we, we've never been very good at assessing risks. Um, uh, I believe that this combined in the United States with a, a, a historically unpopular president among the, among the media elites and, and, and intellectual elites, I think all this was a perfect storm uh, for causing people to use this virus um, as an excuse for social control. I don't think it was, I, I, I don't think it's a, cons- I don't think it was a conspiracy. I'm not buying into the whole great reset thing. This is all designed by someone, but I think all the incentives were in place with such that when, when people did panic and then the media started playing uh, uh, these images over and over again, almost as if B roll. Of, of old people, of people being wheeled, they were always old, but people being wheeled on gurneys through crowded hospitals. And, and we got the constant uh, uh, reports of cases and, and, co- and, and deaths with COVID. Uh, all of this was put this particular pathogen, in my view, and its consequences, its health consequences, vastly out of proportion to its real dangers. And, uh, uh, and then famously, of course, the uh, Imperial College model led by Neil Ferguson, uh, which was British, was the, the British doctor, the British, British doctor at the Imperial College, Imperial College London. I think he's actually a physicist. I don't think he's in. Uh, okay. uh, 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 don't quote. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, I wouldn't bet my pension. But I think he's actually trained as a physicist. I don't do not think he has a medical degree. Um, and he was predicting these these enormous numbers of of fatalities. Uh, a lot of people in Britain, in Europe, you know, on the continent, and in the United States uh, took this as uh, a gospel. They took this as a, a you know a, a, a scientific fact that was going to happen unless we did something extreme. And um, and so the world start shutting down. Uh, and Ferguson later said, if you remember. Not long afterward, uh, that uh, uh, he, he was—I don't remember his exact words—but he he thought lockdowns would be a good thing, but he didn't think we could do them. And then they saw he saw that the Chinese government did it. So wow, it's possible to do. And so um, he advises the British government 
in some capacity to uh, to do just that. And so starting in mid-March of, of 2020, uh, it became overnight, literally almost overnight, uh, uh, the long-standing recommendation of public health officials to not engage in general lockdowns, to engage in what in the great Barrington Declaration is called focused protection. All of that was just discarded and immediately treated as, as unscientific heresy and, and dogma of the unwashed. And the scientific, uh, what was believed to be, what was taken then to be the scientific approach was to lock everybody down and kind of hope this thing goes away. And of course, we had the varying excuses for it. At first, it was going to be two weeks to flatten the curve. We don't want to overwhelm the hospitals. Uh, I think that, that, by the way, is probably the, the single best argument ever given for the lockdowns. If it was the case that we had limited uh, uh, emergency Ventilators room, and Yeah, room exactly. And, and, and at that point, of course, it makes no difference why it, it would have been limited. It, it, it could have been artificially limited because of unwise government policies in the past. But given that's the given in March 2020, it, it may be that uh, uh, the best way to deal with this, to deal with that re sad reality, uh, is harsh measures. We know, we know now, and we, and by now, I mean, as of, I'm thinking at least a year ago, as of June of 2020, we we knew that uh, 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 the lockdowns were not working. Uh, there are some people who still claim that they do. I, I've I've looked at the evidence. Um, I think the over, I think the best evidence, and I think the overwhelming amount of evidence is that lockdowns have absolutely no effect on the spread of of the virus. They All may right. slow it slow it down a tiny tiny bit, uh, but let, let me let me much. push back on that first. First, I want to pile on though for a minute. I, I, when you talk about the media's scare tactics, and obviously they're trying to sell newspapers and hits, views, yep. et cetera. Clicks. Uh, clicks. One of the things that I found and still find somewhat disturbing, but natural, and of course, is the highlighting of some special case, some one in a million tragic outcome that gets a lot of attention and people start to misunderstand what the risks are. Uh, in these cases, I, I remember vividly images of people's lungs that were being shown online to suggest that, you know, doctors were saying, I've never seen anything like this, you know, like a science fiction, you know, alien creature had invaded our lungs and, and scrambled them in ways that yeah. were yeah. unknown. I, I don't think that was a common phenomenon. I think it, it may have happened. Similarly, some, I think some of the heart issues that people worried about reasonably so in the beginning, I don't know if any of them manifested in any large numbers. And, and so let me – that I, I agree with you. I think there was a an enormous uh, anxiety produced by that across most ages, certainly for older people. Uh, I remember being uneasy touching my mail. Uh, I remember being uneasy going grocery shopping, uneasy bringing the groceries into the house, uneasy with the checker, you know, touching my groceries as, as – um, uh, or taking something. I, I remember going to the grocery. I couldn't find an item. And the the employee took it off the shelf and put it in my cart to my horror because he had touched it. I just wanted to find it. I, you know, I could get it myself. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wearing plastic, you know, I'm wearing Ziploc bags on my hands, trying to reduce, holding my shopping cart. Um, it, it was a very scary time and reasonably so. I think at that point, we, we didn't know much about it. I think, I think it's the word lockdown's a bit, um, uh, confusing. I think there are many, many variations on it. So we have countries like Israel, where I am now, Australia, even now, uh, at rec very recently, and certainly China, forbidding people from leaving their homes at all, other than to, um, I think in Israel, I think at the beginning, you walk your dog 100 meters. Um, but you couldn't, you, you really were supposed to stay in your house. Yeah. You were really literally quarantined is in the old time sense of the word. Um, I guess if you're literally quarantined, it's 40 days. Sorry about that. But I meant. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Quarantine's taking on a broader meaning. Kept, kept from the rest of the world. 
at the same time, you know, I think in, in I remember that weekend in mid-March, certainly in the Washington, D.C. area where it was at the time and in New York City, uh, a whole bunch of things were closed. It's not quite the same as quarantining. Any place where people gathered in numbers, uh, bars, restaurants, um, religious institutions, churches, mosques, synagogues, um, sporting events. Many of those were done voluntarily by the private enterprises that, that ran them. Mm-hmm. They canceled the NCAA basketball tournament because they felt it was dangerous for large groups of people to be crowded into, into an indoor arena. And I have to say I'm somewhat sympathetic to that in that we had read, and I think this was true, i uh, be curious on your take, of many so-called super spreader events where one – a choir in a church where people were, you know, standing close together for an extended period of time, singing, which of course produces a lot of particulates into the air, um, and a lot of people in those church in that church choir got got COVID, and many of them died. They, now it's true they many of them were older people, but not all of them. Um, so it's not ob- It seems to me that it'd be a somewhat good idea to stay out of large crowded groups when this thing is running wild, whether you do it voluntarily through the private choices of people while letting others choose to be, take on more risk and attend those sporting events or go to those bars. Um, That doesn't seem like the the worst idea. I think I I would make a distinction between that and shutting down the entire economy other than so-called essential workers, food supply people and health workers, where, where basically you were told to stay in your house for the foreseeable future. Uh, do you think any of those were worth doing? So I think or do, two, do you lump them all two, together? I think there are two things to distinguish. First of all, the, you, you're correct. The term lockdown means means different things. In Virginia, where I am, uh, back when Governor Ralph Northam announced his his first extreme measure, it was called a stay at home order. Now, unlike in Britain, we Virginians weren't weren't really running a risk of being arrested if we technically violated all the details of the stay-at-home order, but it was called a stay-at-home order. So, so the two things to distinguish is voluntary versus coerced. And, and the second is uh, 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 generalized uh, lockdown, gen- generalized staying at home versus focusing the protection on those who are vulnerable, right? So uh, in, in, in what I oppose most was the rejection of the what had been up until 2020, as I understand, and I've read about it since, and it seems to be true. What I what I re, what I oppose most is the rejection in 2020 of the standard public health guidelines that when when a respiratory pathogen such as this one, and it is it is especially dangerous for older people. There's no question about it, or, or people who, with with Especially with, with severe comorbidities, right? Yeah. Um, comorbidities uh, being things like other diseases, uh, obesity, things, other things that aren't good for you. Exactly. Interact exactly. with this in a particularly bad way. Yes. Yeah. There are very, very few people who die of COVID who have no, no comorbidities. One, one reason it mostly kills old people is because the older you get, the more likely you are to, to have cancer. Or know all about it. Don't have cancer. Yeah, well, I've got a lot of things wrong with me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, so. Um, what I oppose most was this rejection of the standard public health recommendation up until 2020 to focus the protection on vulnerable groups and let everyone else go about their lives uh, as, as, as well as possible. Uh, what happened in 20, early 2020 is we reversed that. We just told whatever measures were engaged, it, it, was, it wasn't focused on the vulnerable groups. Uh, we just said to stay home. In some cases, obviously, more the, the 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 dictates were more harsh and draconian than in other places. But even in in the United States, uh, uh, most of us Americans were told to stay home, and so businesses were shuttered. So pe- we we couldn't go about our ordinary uh, business of life. Schools were closed. Um, everybody starts zooming in to meetings, and and and. and I, I like I like uh, Brian Kaplan's my colleague, your former colleague Brian Kaplan's early take on this, and it's the take he still has, and it's one I I return to frequently. He he said, "Why didn't we have a proportionate response?" I think a proportionate response would have been would have him in twofold twofold aspects to it. 
One, it would have been what the Great Barrington Declaration authors call focus protection. Right? We we knew early, we knew in March we had strong evidence even in March of 2020 that this disease is it focuses most of its um, damage on very old people. Um, we knew that, and so let's focus. Let's let's keep let's let's protect them, and let other people go about their business. That's one that's one element of of proportion. Another element of proportion is the degree to which we react at all. And so, as Brian put it in one of his uh, uh, blog posts, at very scholarly blog posts at Econ Log, uh, he he said. Uh, uh, I forget, I'm not quoting him exactly, but he said, you know, if 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 SARS-CoV-2 is ten times worse than the flu, uh, then there's no reason that we shouldn't maybe have ten times the the, the degree of of reaction to it. Uh, but the reaction we had worldwide by mid-March of last year was vastly out of proportion to the dangers of this pathogen compared to ordinary pathogens that we human beings uh, live with annually, um, live with every day. And uh, uh, so I, 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 in my view, the world panicked uh, and it was a panic set off by a, 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 a grotesque failure to be able to assess risks properly and to put risks in perspective. One, one, one final thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Part of the benefit of a more propor proportional and focused approach would be that it allows other important aspects, including narrow health aspects, to be properly considered. It is, if, it is as if starting 16 or 17 months ago, the only goal that humanity had was to protect people from coming into contact with SARS-CoV-2. Everything else was cast aside or, or dramatically diminished in importance. It's almost as if, I said, well, you know, we don't care if, if that child dies of cancer, or if, 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 if that person can't get uh, 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 e emergency treatment for, for uh, you know, uh, diabetes, that's okay, as long as they're not dying of SARS-CoV-2. And so look, all of the costs of these lockdowns, again, both the narrow health costs of the sort that I just gave a hypothetical example, and the, and the larger costs of, of the economic, the narrow economic costs, just the cost of, of suffering, this massive disruption in our social lives, people not being able to go to funerals. It was just a few weeks ago that the mayor of Washington, D.C. decided it was legal once again to dance and to dance at weddings. In Washington D.C., just, just, to, just as recently as a few weeks ago, it was illegal to dance at a wedding, and and so this this um, uh, uh, madness, this I call it COVID derangement syndrome, and what I mean by that is uh, the the focus on the one goal exclusively at the expense of all others, and that is of avoiding contact with the coronavirus. Everything else is, is 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 ignored or severely discounted, and that's a de that's a derangement. It would be a, it would be deranged if we had as our one goal protecting people from dying from cancer or protecting people from dying of ordinary flu or protecting people from getting seasonal colds or protecting people from dying in automobile accidents. If you have one goal above all, um, then you you become you become obsessively deranged. So I want to I want to focus on the costs of uh, our response, which are often forgotten. It's fascinating to me. I think they'll increasingly be remembered as as the years and months and years pass, and we see them more vividly. But um, you talked about some of the fact that you know I think people were very afraid to go to the hospital uh, for health treatment for a while uh, at the beginning of the crisis, in particular. Um, Again, some of that would have happened regardless of government policy. I think it would have been a natural response to the um, to the media coverage. Mm -hmm. And then the next, so you have these direct sort of health related costs where treatment or uh, availability of treatment or the willingness of people to get the treatment was was reduced. Then you have the financial so-called, I would call monetary costs. Um, 
people out of work, people losing um, their lo- their businesses, their livelihoods. Um, for me, the most interesting set of these, I'll, I'll throw in. Then let me add the, the children who lose years of school, a year or so of schooling. Uh, to me, that's the most stunning, inexplicable part of this. Yes, there are older teachers who who may have been may have been at risk. Um, a colleague of ours who I will not name. Then, then, they, then they should have stayed home. Yeah, a colleague of mine who who I will not name, or actually a former colleague, suggested to me very early on in the pandemic that public choice would lead one to conclude from this that the people in power who made the decisions about economic activity are older, and had we had a measured response of the kind you're talking about, they would have had to stay home and everybody else would have gone about their business. And those positions of power, CEOs, government officials would have been filled by younger people. So they did have a natural incentive to have a general response to this rather than a focused one on the elderly. I don't know if that's played a role. It, it, it is an interesting hypothesis. Um, so then you have the, the so you have students, children, uh, under the age of 20 who have virtually no risk of dying of COVID. Uh, and right. certainly we don't close down schools, as you say, in in the winter because there's a flu risk. Tragically, children do die of flu. Young people they die of flu. They are more likely to die of a seasonal flu than they are of COVID-19. And we don't close schools, at COVID-19. least for now. It'd be interesting. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so we had that loss, the loss of socialization, the loss of learning. Um Mostly, tragically, I think, for poorer people in public schools, which were much more likely to shut down than private schools. And then the next set of losses and costs of this policy, I think, are the more interesting ones because they're the hardest to see. It's the inability to dance at the wedding. It's the inability to see someone smile uh, on when you're having a tough day because they're wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. The inability to be a human being. We basically took 15 months and shoved people into their caves uh, their homes on Zoom and said, you know, stick it out. Now, if it, it had been a real plague, like the bubonic, bubonic plague or the black plague, maybe that would have been a good idea. It, it seems we did kind of overreact. And of course, the financial costs that were incurred by the government, we don't know what the full cost of those will be and possible inflation, uh, other I think it's costed. happening already. Yeah, possibly. Um, so, I want to. So, I th- I agree with you. The question is, could we have done anything differently in the political sense? So, l- let me try to give the alternative view, and I give it because you know I've said on here before. I'm sure that you know everybody has their own weird COVID thing. You know, you might look at what somebody else does. I have a colleague here. Um, in Israel, who who told me that he washed, he wouldn't touch his mail for three days. That turned out to be for a while. I don't know how. Maybe still does it. That, that turned out to be unnecessary. We didn't know it at the time. Right. I, I remember being uncomfortable picking up my mail. I remember thinking I should wait a while, before, you know, after it's gotten put in the box. Uh, so I, under, I understand all that. But so many times you see a, someone else doing something, and you think, well, that's ridiculous. And then you realize, well, but I do X which that person thinks is ridiculous. And I just X makes me feel good. So I, you know, I do it. I wash my canned peas or whatever it is. Um, so I, I, I think when you talk about the media response to this, and it's really a, you know, it was a tremendous opportunity for the media to, <laughs> to get attention. It's un, un, unavoidably attractive for them. Once that's out there, I think it's quite difficult for human beings to respond to these kind of situations rationally. Yeah. It creates an enormous demand for political action. I'll give you an example here in Israel. We've um, again, we're recording this in late June of 2021. We have a new prime minister, Naftali Bennett. Uh, the early days in Israel with the virus went very badly, but Netanyahu uh, or his ministers. Not sure who was responsible, but he's clearly had something to do with it. Negotiated a deal with Pfizer where they would get very quick access to large amounts of Pfizer vaccine in return for giving Pfizer um, data on its impact. As a result, Israel got vaccinated at a very quick rate and very quickly returned to normal life. Really a great thing. Um, And yet, right now, 
the Delta variant is starting to spread here in Israel. And as far as I know, and maybe I don't know the science, don't quote, no one, no one should live their life according to what I'm about to say. But as far as I understand it, at least here in Israel, the Delta variant is mostly as asymptomatic. I don't think it's led to any hospitalizations or deaths, but people are very nervous. And I think the new politician, the new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, wants to show he's not going to be asleep on the job. He's going to be – so they've already – Start to talk about mandates of masks in indoor settings. Perhaps, perhaps they will also start to curtail outdoor gatherings, which, of course, is the beginning of a return to something more like a yep. lockdown. Yep. Now, I'm not going to criticize Prime Minister Bennett for that. I understand that as a new prime minister, he has to look zealous. Um, you know, he, I don't expect the Prime Minister of Israel, the President of the United States, the Prime Minister of, of, of England to say, you know, it's a free society. People should make their own decisions, make these decisions for themselves. Um, and uh, of course, if you're older, we advise you to take more precautions. That just is so hard to imagine that flying in 2021 in a Western country. And in a minute, we'll talk about externalities. I understand some listeners are immediately, especially those trained in economics, are immediately going, of course they need to, they can't rely on people's own judgments. They're imposing costs on others if they don't wear a mask, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, I just want to make the point that I think the political response to this is not a, um, it's not surprising. It is demanded, I think, by most of the public. They expect their leaders to save them protect them from the ills of everything, COVID being one of them. And because of that media coverage, it became the ill that we expected everyone to focus on because we were focused on it. I certainly was. I looked at every single day, looked at the paper for cases and deaths, hoping for a turnaround, looking at states that I might you know, be visiting soon and whether I'd be able to get there and what I'd be doing. And so I, I think the when you decry the response, I'm sympathetic, but I, I'm not sure the politicians, given the culture that we live in in the United States and elsewhere in the West and elsewhere, I, I'm not sure it's so surprising that we, quote, overreacted. It's almost if, as if anything less than an overreaction would be intolerable to the body politic. So I'm the last person to defend government, government officials. Um, I, I think you're cor correct about the logic of of political action. Right? Politicians are not leaders. Politicians are followers. Right? But this fact is combined with the myth that they are leaders. Correct. And it's com right. And, and, and are to be praised for their great response to whatever. And, and, and so, ironically, so so the science, the science, the the, the claim is that our leaders are following the science. So the science, of course, can't tell you what to do. The so science tells us what, as best as it can, what reality is about. Science cannot make trade-offs for us. Science can't tell me what the appropriate amount of risk is I should take when I decide to drive a, an automobile when it's snowing outside as opposed to staying home. That's not a scientific question. Science can say, you know, your risk of driving with this amount of snow of being in an automobile accident goes up by X percent compared to driving uh, absent snow, then it's up to me to make to make the judgment. And so if the goal and this is this is what is surprising to me. So I'm not I'm not surprised by politicians, of course, uh, uh, responding to whatever they think the public uh, uh, wants in order to increase the public's prospects of, of voting for the politicians in, in place. Um, what surprised me was not so much the politicians. What surprised me is how easily the general public was spooked by this one disease. Now, I'm a little less surprised now as I reflect on it when, when you reflect on how the media utterly, dist utterly distorted this, this disease. I believe utterly distorted it, way out of proportion. I'll give, I'd like to give you a couple of examples in just a moment. Uh, once the media utterly distorts it, again, seeing pictures of people with shopping bags lying dead on the street in Wuhan, B-roll of people being uh, a, a rolled through hospital emergency rooms. Um, uh, then the public is panicked. 
the public, uh, yes, re- wants action. And we have this ideology now that the government, can, the government somehow contains powers that are, that are almost godlike. And if only we, in emergencies, we, 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 we let this godlike institution exercise its powers, then it can save us. Um, uh, of course, people have believed that government has godlike powers long before COVID came along. Government has godlike powers to, in many people's minds, to raise wage rates, to protect people from, uh, from shortages caused by natural disasters, on and on and on. Russ, you and I, you and I write about this all the time. Uh, but the, 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 the media, uh, so I, I, I don't excuse politicians, right? But they're, you and I, I agree with you about their incentive system. And maybe I, the, I should say the same thing about the media. They, they should. <laughs> incentives too. But, but, but just a couple of examples, and there were many, I could, I could spend the rest of our time just giving examples. But I'll give two examples of how the media, um, in my view, utterly misinformed people. Number one, the Wall Street Journal, I don't remember when this was, maybe February or January of this year, 2021, maybe December. Wall Street Journal had this, this headline report of how middle-aged men are bearing the brunt of COVID. And I can't remember exactly what the headline Middle-aged men are bearing the, the brunt of COVID. It, implying it's not old people, it's middle-aged men. So you read, the bearing the brunt of, I think that is part of the quote, part of the quotation from the headline. You read the story. You know what the story was? You know, you know, you know what the finding was? That middle-aged men have a slightly higher risk of dying from COVID than do middle-aged women. Well, this is not middle-aged men bearing the brunt of COVID. No. This is, no. right? the second, there's this columnist for the Washington Post, a physician, Leanna Wynn, who also is a personality on CNN. And as recently as this month, June, and last month, May, and again in this month, June, she writes these columns in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, saying, oh, it's a myth to think that COVID is not uh, uh, a a danger to children. We can't let our guard down until all children are vaccinated. Um, And and then she she says, the CDC reported that 16,000 something children uh, have have been hospitalized with with COVID in the past twelve months or some some time period. So when I read this, I looked at I went to the CDC. Sure enough, her figure is correct. Then I looked at the hospitalizations of children for other things, you know, falls, uh, uh, influenza, <laughs> and the CD, the, the the hospitalizations of children, people eighteen and younger, or excuse me, seventeen and younger, uh, for 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 COVID was way down on the list. But she picks up this one number, it sounds huge. And then she says, as a mother of three, I myself keep my children masked. And so, and she even she even wrote, quoting the New York Times, not longer, COVID is a major killer of children. It is simply not. It's, this is just a false, it's a lie. But I think I think it's a great example of of what being trained in economics uh, does for you versus trained in other fields. And I think how to look at life. It's not easy, but I think it's an extremely important point. COVID does. Well, a lot control. of people who are trained in economics, though, who I think went well, off the rails. Well, well, well maybe matter. we'll come back to that. But my point is that COVID does kill children. No doubt about it. Um, not many. Not many relative to other things. I think what's interesting the, the no, but even absolutely. I mean, even absolutely. I think the number of children, I forget the exact age breakdown, but the number of children, CDC, maybe 14 or younger, 12 or younger, literally it's in three digits. It's like 324. Right. But it, doesn't, it doesn't matter because that could have been your child. And therefore, you as a parent have an obligation to keep your child safe. And now when I say it that way, I think a lot of people go, well, that makes sense. Of course, it means that you should not send your kid to school in the fall when it starts to get cold in the fall. You should not let it your children ride in automobiles? Never, uh, unless they're wearing a special kind of suit or a helmet of some special kind. Right? We put our. It, it, it's a very interesting thing that we put our kids in. You should not in. let your children leave the house. You should put them in a right. bubble. Yeah. Of course. And we all understand, well, that's a mistake, but we can't take that logic. We struggle to take that logic that we see as normal, especially as economists, 
and bring it to bear on the issue that is front and center, which in our minds, because of media coverage and our own brains, which is, is right now is COVID. Um, I, another example of this, which I know bothers you, and I'd like you to talk about it for a minute, bothered me. I'm not going to get it right. doesn't matter. More people have died from COVID now in the United States than World War I, World War II, the Civil War. You know, it's not, not the Civil War, I don't think, but, but a whole bunch of wars combined. Close to the Civil War, according and, to the and records. I, and I'm thinking, that's not a relevant comparison. You, you don't want to talk about the tragic deaths in wartime of 18 and 20-year-olds in defense of a, a freedom or your national sovereignty or wherever it happens to be to people who die of a disease that if they chose, they could take more or fewer precautions. And the people who die tend to be, as you say, 75 and older. It's not the same level. It's just not, it's not a meaningful comparison. And yet it was invoked often by people, often, sometimes economists. And I always found it, it's interesting, I found it offensive. I think when I say that, people go like, well, what's wrong with you? They're just, they're all deaths. Uh, but I think, I think it's important and useful to distinguish between certain kind of deaths, deaths Absolutely. that you can avoid by your behavior. You know, if, if going into war, it would be foolish not to wear your helmet. Uh, there are certain things you try to do to reduce the risk of death, even in war, which is extremely dangerous when you're in the front lines. Uh, and again, I think in COVID, the right response was for people who are particularly vulnerable, comorbidities, people with comorbidities and elder, the elderly, to stay out of groups. Um, yeah. We understand, of course, or we should, that that's harder for some people than others. Uh, I think a lot of people died in multifamily groups, multifamily households, where people had to work, had to go out into the world, uh, and probably infected their elderly relatives living with them. It's an incredible tragedy. I, I don't want anything you're saying or that I'm saying to suggest that this there aren't horrible, tragic aspects to this to this uh, disease. No, right. no that, one that, here is denying COVID. No one here is denying that COVID for certain groups is much more dangerous. Than and it's horrible. And, yeah. is, and, is, and, and it's been a, and, and, our, and that there were other responses other than even proportionate lockdowns or focused lockdowns that might've, that might've been better. Let's, let's talk. Can, can, I, can I say where you, you mentioned the comparison, you know, I've yeah. seen, well, you know, COVID's kill, killed the number of people, you know, it's, it's, you know, dozens of jumbo jets falling out of the sky loaded with passengers. Um, I think it was the 2017, 2018, flu, a recent flu season uh, in, in the United States killed roughly, so one year flu season, killed roughly 60,000 people, right? And I, I didn't see anyone back then. I, I don't recall it. I, I, I'm quite sure no one did it. Oh, this is terrible. This is more killed more Americans than were killed in Vietnam. Right. right. But but if someone is if someone had said that and, and if the press had focused on that, they could have whipped us up so into that's a frenzy of whatever variant of flu that was a few years ago. That's my question. Is it possible that if we treated the flu like this, we could get people to be as worried about their general activities in the winter as they are now about COVID generally? This is my great fear. This is my great fear. Right. Uh, we, we, we live, look, some, we're all going to die of something. It's an un, unfortunate, I know, but it's true, <laughs> right? And, and so every day, each of us encounters a range of risks. Part of that's by choice. Part of that's just by happenstance. And uh, uh, things such, and, and, and a lot of these risks are shared in, in the sense of being passed on from one person to another without, you know, without, without a contract. Right. Yeah. Um, respiratory diseases are not new. They're not going away. Uh, uh, and they, they are on a spectrum of some are more risky than others. SARS-CoV-2 is more risky than the typical respiratory disease. Um, uh, but SARS-CoV-2 was treated as, as a categorically different threat. It was not and is not a categorically different threat. It's higher on the spectrum. Uh, and and again, its its targets are, are, are thankfully very focused, and thankfully very focused on the part of the population that you would, given that it exists, you want it to be focused on far better. That it it it, it kills mostly old people than kills mostly children. Anyone who disagrees with that, I think they're either inhuman or or they don't really believe what they say. 
I mean, I, I just, I, 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 you and I, Russ, are both over 60. And if given the choice, someone says, okay, we're going to have the disease. It's going to infect. It's going to, and, and it's going to have disproportionate impact. The disproportionate impact is going to be on people 60 and older, or it's going to be on people 30 and younger. What would you choose? I would have, it's not even a choice. Of course, 60 and older, right? Um, uh, I think every and, human and, being, every human being, I say, you know, Don, Don, I know you've been engaged in some philosophical debates about this. Um, of course, every life is precious, uh, but every life is finite. We all, we all, yeah. I think we're pretty much in agreement on that. Um, I think most human beings act the way you say, whether they debate the way you say is a different question. I think most people, we certainly parents feel that way about their children, whether they feel that way about strangers' children, I guess it's a little more complicated, but. Of course. Um, I'm gonna come back to the 60,000 number on the flu. Yeah. Which is, by the way, a an entire football stadium uh, of deaths. Yeah, can you uh, imagine you how can, horrible you can make, that would You be? can dramatize it. Um, yeah. I think the question is, and I think I, I'm kind of drilling down here in our in our thinking about the policy related to this. I think most people would say, well, you know, it's horrible that 60,000 people die of the flu, but what, you're not going to send kids to school in the winter? And the answer is, no, that would be foolish, given that 60, it was 600,000 or 6 million or 60 million or most children died of the flu. We'd probably shut down school in the winter. And again, this gets back to the idea of proportionate response. We don't shut down school in the winter. And in fact, we generally uh, understand we there's been a slight change, I'd say, in our culture over the last 20 years. There is a lot of encouragement of hand washing and covering your mouth when you cough in the winter. And sneeze. That's probably a good thing. I, I'm not. I've done that all my life. Yeah, fine. I'm 62 I, years old. I've done all my life. <laughs> but I think that's a good thing. I, I think the feeling was that this was different, and it's not just different because that it, you know, it disproportionately kills older people or affects older people than younger people. I think the idea was we can stop this without doing anything. Um, it's imaginable. Flu is not imaginable. I think most people say, well, a flu. That's what happens in the winter. But COVID, we can, we can. Take these measures. I think the real question. And I, it's a fatal no, conceit. Yeah, there's fatal no answer. Conceit. There's no answer to the question of whether it's worth it. You know, you've you've criticized the Neil Ferguson um, Imperial College forecast. You know, the defenders of of those policies would say, well, you know, if we hadn't done anything, we might have lost two or four million people in the United States, or forty, whatever. I can't remember now the the, the number, and we did lose. A, a very much more larger number of people than I expected we would we would lose. I would have lost many bets early on about you know what the, I thought it would be. That's eh, not worth it talking about, but it's silly. Yeah. But but the point is is that you can. I think a, I think most people feel that the measures we took, some draconian, some merely strong, they saved thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. And I think the burden for approved for you and and others, and I'm sympathetic to your viewpoint. I'm not 100% convinced, but yeah, you, know, you got to show that 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 isn't the case. That that these strong measures that were both mandated by law and urged by our culture were ineffective, and we should have gone about our lives unless we were old and 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 infirm. The old and firm shouldn't have gone about their lives. They should, we should have done everything to protect them. And I think the, the great insight of uh, the Great Barrington Declaration and um, the folks, Jay Bhattacharya, who's been on this program, the others, the two other epidemiologists who, who signed it. Sinatra Gupta that, and Martin Kuldor. Right. Thank you. Since, since we spent billion, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars, in response to this, much of which was ineffective and theater alone, we could have done glorious things to reduce the risk to the people who are most at risk. And I think that's the policy failure, the public health failure. Um, I don't know if that would have been politically possible. I don't know if it will be politically possible if we have another bout of it, a different variant down the road. But I think that's what we should have done if you are an interventionist. If you don't believe in the rights of individuals uh, in a free society to choose their own levels of risk, then please respond proportionately to the people most at risk. Spend the funds to help them who are most at risk. We didn't do that. 
it, it's weird what we did. And I think an enorm where I agree with you is an enormous proportion. The question is whether it's 100 percent of what we'd actually did was theater. And I, I don't think it's true in the in the in large clusters of, of groups. I think that probably was a good idea, uh, especially for older people and uh, obviously. But it's going to be hard the next time not to do the exact same thing. I think that's what's on the table. I think uh, this is a great fear of mine. I, I, I think it's happening as well. A couple of things. I don't I, I, the, the, the best data uh, to measure the impact of SARS-CoV-2 and the reaction, the government reaction, well, people's reaction to it, private and, and, and mandatory, uh, will be, I think, excess deaths over the course of a few years, right? Um, and, and so uh, I wouldn't bet my pension on this prediction, but I suspect that I, 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 I'm quite confident that excess fatalities over the next few years will be will run uh, uh, low, lower than average for the next year or two because COVID has has killed its main victims. Were Some involved, of the most vulnerable, vulnerable people vulnerable would have died the, shortly thereafter. In, in the population. And so this is why I disagree with those people, and there are many, left, right, and center, who insist that the age profile of COVID's impact is irrelevant. I, I, I alluded to this earlier. I just, I, I can't get my head around why anyone would think that that is, that fact is irrelevant. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's relevant uh, chiefly or, or in, in large part because it tells us it's, it's important information for how to react to it. If this disease is killing people randomly, regardless of age, regardless of health, then one kind of reaction, uh, uh, the, the best kind of reaction would surely be different than the reaction that we ought to have had knowing early on that SARS-CoV-2 is overwhelmingly dangerous to old people. Um, and it, because we can then focus our response. And by focusing our response, of course, this is the economic point. It's, and and it's, it's, it's no surprise that Jay Pacharia himself is, has a degree in economics as, as, as well as a medical degree. Um, by, by, by resources are scarce. This is Econ 101. <laughs> by focusing response, we can, we can marshal our resources, husband our resources better where they have a, 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 the, the best impact rather than just randomly uh, uh, imposing costs on, 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 on people worldwide. I, I forget what my, my, what my second point was, but, oh, oh, I know, I know, I know what it was. So, um, I, I, I get I get you raised the political point. Y yes, politicians cannot be in a way. It's, of course, it's not surprising that politicians screw things up. Politicians screw things up all the time. I mean, they're all, it's almost like a profession. They're in the screw things up profession, in my view. I'm very cynical, not cynical. I think I'm realistic about politicians. Right? Um, I know not everyone agrees with with me on this. You, you're closer to agreeing with me on this, uh, but I, I don't think that is. I don't think the incentives that politicians face and respond to as we predict that they would, will respond, I don't think that is an excuse to, 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 to let them off the hook, of course. And so, yeah. so every time there's a natural disaster, politicians will complain about and some of them will take actions against so-called price gouging, right? It's not the economist's role to say, well, that's the political incentive. It is, we understand where that's a political incentive, right? But we don't say, well, therefore, what else can we do? We, we just have, have to accept it. We understand when, when, when a natural disaster comes, prices start to rise, the media is going to complain, politicians will pontificate against the pr price increases. It's the economist's job to point out why uh, what's said about the, 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 the higher prices and about the proposed attempt to keep prices from rising, why all of that is economically mistaken. That's what we do. And, the, and yeah, so people were thrown into a fright, a huge fright about COVID. Politicians, of course, responded in the way in the ways that they did for the reasons that you pointed out that, but, but that is all the more reason why, why we economists should have kept saying, uh, uh, look, there's an opportunity cost to what you're doing. Uh, well, I think that's why we have to salute. Huge opportunity cost. I think that's okay. why we have to salute the signers of the Great Barrington Declaration because- I salute them every day. Because yeah. obviously public health officials have a choice just like economists, just like politicians as to whether to 
get on the bandwagon of making sure everyone's really scared because on the grounds that, well, it's better than not being scared, better to be better safe than sorry. And so, um, yeah. I think that ignores the trade-offs that are inevitably involved with, with being overly cautious, whether they're losing losses in the quality of life and so on. I, I, I don't want to miss our chance to talk about externalities and, and yeah. Ronald Coase, because I think, you know, there was a profound moment. I think I've alluded to this before, but after the tragic death of uh, George Floyd, uh, there were a lot of protests and um, many of them were done without masks in the street, people close together for long periods of time. And I believed, and I think most people believe whether they thought about it or not, that there's an issue of justice here. And it's true, it could be risky to be in a large group of protesters. Um, but some things are more important than, than the riskiness of, of death. And fighting injustice is surely one of those, I think, I hope, one of those things. Mm -hmm. And no one said, well, we have to ban, excuse me, not no one, but most people didn't say, well, we have to stop those protests because those people who are protesting are spreading COVID to others against their will. There's a negative externality. People understood that a negative externality by itself is not sufficient to invoke a government ban uh, that, that that's often a price worth paying. And yeah. uh, I think people often use a negative externality as, as a, it's, it's an automatic proof that something needs to be done when in fact it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think the vaccine opportunity, which has been an incredible tribute to human creativity, unbelievable story. And uh, it makes, um, I, when I, I remember getting my first shot, it was, uh, it's really an incredibly moving thing for me to, it hurt one reason it was moving, but, uh, when I realized how much knowledge was in that syringe that, that was right. I'm, I'm poison. If you think about how crazy this is, I'm poisoning myself and I'm doing it with joy because I know that it will make me better, give me more choice, give me more freedom. And a lot of people have, have argued, everybody has to be vaccinated because, if you don't vaccinate, you're, you're at risk of spreading the disease asymptomatically to people who are vulnerable. And I think that's just a fundamental um, misunderstanding of externalities. I think you agree with me. So why don't you make the case? So, so let me, before we get to the coast point, let me just mention Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt and, 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 and his work. So, you know, during those, during the Black Lives Matter protests last summer, summer of 2020, uh, lots of the very same people in the media who were who were just horrified that people that college students would go to the beach and and right. and, and party, uh, uh, no excuse for congregating. Somehow, you know, they they would they would say things like, "Well, the importance of protesting against racial injustice is is greater than the risk." Now, I, it, it, th I this is a right. nice recognition of of of, of, <laughs> trade -offs. of, of trade offs, right? Yeah. But 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 but. Protesting, fighting racial injustice is not the only uh, thing, not the only alternative that human beings have. There are many, many things that uh, uh, are lost if we are prevented by, by law or by fear from, from, from congregating with others. Uh, the protest against race, but, but so, you know, Jonathan Haidt's idea about how you know, if you want to believe something, you, the mind can construct a justification for, for cognitive dissonance and all. I of think it. I think he got it from David Hume, but he did. By his by his own admission, he got it from David. So. I think he, so. He got it from David Hume. It's um, probably it's probably in the Bible. Confirmation bias. I can't. I can't remember. I'm sure. Where my, I, confirmation I, bias is is a well. I'm sure people have understood it for a while. Yeah. So so but I love Jonathan. By the way. God bless oh, him. The, I was, the righteous mind past, is past the contact mind. guess. Yeah, no, no, no problems with him. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was praising him. And, and, and anyway, so uh, I don't think that the age, the, the very distinct age profile of COVID's impact is necessary to justify what I'm about to say. Uh, but it only makes what I'm about to say, I think, stronger. Right. Uh, uh, as Ronald Coase pointed out, so, so let's define externality, right? So a negative externality is one person acts and has a negative impact on, on, on someone who, who didn't agree. Against their will, yeah. Negatively. 
Yeah. Right. So, so the first thing to note is we are a, a gregarious herd-like species. We are constantly <laughs> acting in ways that that have have quote unquote negative impacts on other people. Only a small handful of which uh, are legally classified or even ethically classified as as a negative externality. Um, uh, and, and, and so, but you know, pollution is the classic. That's what we students of economics learn about as eighteen-year-olds. Well, pollution is a classic externality: smokestacks spewing out soot, and it's harming the residents or the other businesses nearby. And the, you know, the standard view that most people have is, well, the the, the pollution's caused by the factory, and so we got to we got to impose a cost on the factory and make the factory stop imposing the externality. And, and Ronald Coase's brilliant and yet simple. Insights. It's amazing, how, it's amazing, Russ, how much of good economics comes from very simple insights. Uh, was that well? Uh, it, it's not necess- It's not just the factory that's causing the pollution. It's also the people who are uh, living near the factory that's causing pl- the pollution. It takes two to tango. It takes two to externalize. If no one lived next to the factory, then the factory's particular solutions that fall to the ground would be an exter- externality of no one. And so the question is. Who, which is the lowest cost means of avoiding the problem? Uh, do we move the factory? Do we impose a tax on the factory? Do we cause? Do we compel the factory to 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 reduce it, the amount of particulate solution, or do we put the responsibility on the homeowners to move away from the factory's airflow or or to to, 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 to endure yeah. or yeah. to wear masks, right? And uh, uh, so it so. What, what what this insight immediately points out is you just cannot, it, 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 it's a mistake to look at the physical emitter of something and then conclude that, well, that physical emitter should be the party that that bears the cost of avoiding the problem. And before so you go on, Don, huh? sorry, I'm going to interrupt yeah. for a sec. Sorry, I apologize. But yeah. I think the average listener is going, are you out of your mind? I mean, come on, who else is at fault if it's not the person emitting the poison? And I think the way to think about it, if you want to try to open your mind to this Kosian idea, is that it really it's wrong to even think about the factory. The factory is making some product that is enjoyed by hundreds, thousands, yeah. perhaps millions of people. Yeah. Let's let's suppose that the people near the factory are uncomfortable we could we they could be uncomfortable from the pollution they could be harmed they could be killed we we could think of a whole range and right. similarly we could think of the fact that the people who enjoy the product that the factory makes should pay a little bit more or maybe they shouldn't be allowed to have the product at all we we could we could have an enormous range of responses and and i think what people often forget in these situations and we may be able to bring it back to covid i hope and and illustrate it is that once you say it's only the pol- the so-called polluter, the emitter, who is at fault, and it's not a joint problem, mm-hmm. you're giving license to the people who live nearby to impose costs on others. Yes. And you may decide, yes. well, that seems fair in this situation. But when you start to think about it, there'll be other cases where it won't seem so fair. And the example I just gave, if the factory makes the people living near the, let's say it's noise pollution, it's unpleasant, it's not murderous, it's not doesn't kill the people. It just makes a certain time of day less pleasant. Should they have the right, therefore, then to not allow the people to, do they have the right to stop the people who enjoy this product that is made with the noisy mechanism, the opportunity to, to enjoy it? What if it's a life-saving product, right? Yeah. If you start to think about it in the different range of costs and benefits, you start to realize it, it's more complicated than you thought. The second and I think point- that, that's really Coase's great insight. Yeah, the yeah. Coase's great insight was not what we economists call the Coase theorem. Uh, Coase's great insight was the the the, bi- the bilateral nature, the mutual causality of 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 so-called externalities. The second place I moved, I lived in Northern Virginia, was in a- Old Town Alexandria. So, in nineteen December of nineteen eighty five, I moved into a high rise, right on the at a condo, I rented a condo in a high rise uh, that was that was right by the flight path of planes coming into to what's now Reagan National. I knew that when I moved there, right? And sure enough- The rent was less as a result, almost and, certainly. That, that, <laughs> and and I, I knew that as well. I knew that as well. I would have liked to have gotten the lower rent and not had plane noises, but but 
so the closest point is, so who's causing my harm? I chose to move there. I contributed to me suffering this, this negative impact. But it's not, a, but truly no one would say I'm a victim. Um, uh, and, and so that, that's what, that's what goes to me. So, so to put this into the COVID context, um, uh, uh, let's, let's grant that shutting everyone in their homes or doing whatever was the range of the various lockdowns that different governments did uh, had a had a positive impact on COVID cases and COVID hospitalizations and, and COVID uh, fatalities, actually reduced those. Right? That, of course, is a good thing. But that fact is not sufficient to, to then conclude that therefore these measures were justified. What did we get? What did we what did so this is kind of subtle what did we give up uh, what what did we lose even if we discover we do a we, you know god comes down and does a cost benefit and says well the 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 cost of what you lost as a result of these actions are greater than the benefits of the of the lives of the lives saved um uh, uh excuse me even it says the benefits uh, of the, of the lives saved are greater than the cost of the actions it still doesn't prove that the actions that we took were appropriate because there might have been a better set of actions that we could have taken. Cheaper. <laughs> yes, yes. So that so that the less benefit, repressive, less destructive of the human experience. Yeah, uh, uh, a pedantic economist will will will, as you and I know, will will, will nitpick at at, at at what I at what I just said about how we reckon costs and and benefits. But the cosian point is if. If there is a lower cost way of dealing with the problem, uh, uh, that's the way we, we should go. Uh, and so uh, because, particularly because of the differential age impact of COVID, uh, focus protection was, was especially easy or easier compared to what had been had the disease stri stri struck, and ran stri struck randomly. So, right. so, so, uh, let's uh, 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 have older people and people who are at unusually high risk of, of suffering from COVID, uh, let them take steps to, to protect them and let the rest of us go about our business. This is the focus protection point. But I think it's especially important when we think about vaccination and the vaccination of children, uh, especially in, in the, as we get to younger and younger ages. A lot of people have said we, we need to start vaccinating all the children. The children, of course, there are side effects of vaccination. I think they're quite small. I don't want. I want to be clear about that. Uh, that's not again irrelevant, but it's quite small. But the real argument is, when we put restrictions of various kinds on young people on the on the grounds that they could interact with older people, that's the real argument. Most people concede, as you have pointed out, that the risk to younger people is quite small. But but the externality is what's relevant. They'll then say they need to, they might go out and, and associate with an older person, un, and the older person, unknowing because of the asymptomatic say nature of the disease that the young person has, they'll pass COVID on. The real question then is, should the older person have the right to mandate X? X could be a vaccine. It could be a lockdown for their freedom to be able to go outside. The great insight of COS is that those two sides are, are, are really hard to judge even. Forget this, his main point is you do the one that's cheapest. But there's also an ethical point there that I think is often lost. People often criticize COS on ethical grounds saying, well, he treats everything like it's a cost benefit analysis. But I think there's a deeper yeah. point here, which is that if we say to young people, you don't have the right to be free, because you might put older people at risk, you're essentially empowering older people to say, I have decided you cannot enjoy life because I'm at risk. And yeah, I don't you, want to bear the cost of having to stay inside. Yeah. I want to be free to go out. And it's really kind of hard to argue ethically which one of those is better. Uh, you know, would, there are other costs though you'd want to bring into the question. It, but I think most people just kind of go, well, the younger person's putting the older person at risk. There's an inexpensive way most of the time for the older person to reduce that risk. And that's uh, tragically, unfortunately, in this world is to stay home. Yeah. Instead, 
we've told the young people to stay home. I don't see that as like a great moral achievement. But uh, And I, I think the invoking of externalities there is a misunderstanding of the ethical situation. So everyone, everyone knows, I don't think it's doubted, that uh, teenagers, particularly teenage men, teenage boys, 16, 17, 18, 19, they are much more dangerous drivers than are older people. Right. Yep. Uh, so whenever a teenage male gets on the road, the there is an increased risk of of death or injury yep. to everyone else on the road. So do we say t- teenage boys, you can't drive? I mean, that would that would, in fact, reduce the risk. It is a fact that when teenage boys get on the road, it save lives, it, 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 it saves lives. But we, 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 if, we, if we, they don't, if we stop, we, we don't do that because we recognize. So if, if, if you are if you are especially fearful of being killed by a teenager on the road, don't drive. You have that you have that freedom. But you know, Russ, you and I are both in our 60s. We know this about teenagers. I, I drive all the time, knowing in the back of my head that whenever I get into an automobile, my chances of being uh, horribly killed go up slightly. You yeah, know well, that too. It's also the case, of course, that it's a U-shaped curve. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> As yes. you get older, you're, we're both heading toward that that territory not, not, where not, not there not there yet but, but, but we're well, both heading toward a territory i want to just say for the record don is recording this with very little sleep so don't get behind the wheel of a car don uh, well <laughs> I, I wouldn't well, mandate it tonight but i would request it as if I, as your friend i have to drive to arlington to teach later on but i'm oh, going to okay. take a nap i'm going to take a nap All right. um yeah and so and so it, it i think the 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 point here is merely pointing out that person a's actions has a potential negative impact on person B is not sufficient not to proven. classify that <laughs> as a negative externality that requires government intervention. Yeah. Uh, but particularly when, particularly when it each individual party or the party negatively impacted uh, has a great deal of scope to protect himself or herself uh, against against the matter. You know, if if, if if I don't want to talk about global warming, but 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 you know that, that's sort of the ultimate global global phenomenon. Very very few of us have the, you know, in some sense, we do buy, buy better air conditioners or something, I suppose. But in the case of in the case of COVID, because we know it it, 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 it if I'm 85 and I have diabetes or 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 some other ailment, I I'm still going to wear a mask if 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 I'm going outside. I'm going to stay away from public gatherings, um, but. I am not, if I'm that age, and I really believe this, I'm not, I really believe this, I am not going to demand that other people rest- restrict their lives in the way that I restrict my life, because be- just on the grounds that by them staying at home, that adds a further minuscule reduction to the risk that, that I undertake, or that I, want, I am subjected to. I just want to add, I have no problem with a society that views its elderly with reverence. And thinks that people who are 75 or 80 or even 66, hypothetically, uh, that their lives might be worth more than than we might think, even though their remaining lifespans might be short. And we might choose as a, as not as a society that doesn't have any meaning, but we might choose as individuals to behave in a certain way out of respect for the elderly. But to ensconce that as government policy doesn't uh, automatically follow, I would argue, but. Yeah, yeah, and what what happened with COVID is it's, it 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 is almost as if the the the, the goal was to the, the, the adding a few months or years to the lives of very old people uh, is was worth whatever costs the rest of society had to bear in order to do that. Uh, I I I think that was a horrible mistake. I believe that if human beings remain rational. Uh, that history will look back upon the past two years as uh, probably the the single greatest self-inflicted uh, uh, damage to humanity, short of shooting wars. And while I just spoke recently a minute ago of the reverence we could have for the elderly, I think most of us, especially the way we feel, those of us who have children, uh, I have plenty of reverence for my children. I do not want them to have restricted lives in order to make my life better. I find that rather appalling, actually. Yeah, I I fully agree. My guest today has been Don Boudreau. Don, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thanks, Russ.
This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.